Hi there, Mark. Naomi, I think I just actually I was testing my video and I think you were uh, you were just joining it. <laughs> I'm good. I'm um, thank you so much now for uh, giving me some time today to chat with you about the group and what you guys have been up to. Oh, of course, of course. It's funny because just as I was logging off, I was going to go get prepared. I saw your face pop up. I was like, I think I just hung up on it. That was rude. <laughs> Did you see no me? Worries. Yeah, it popped up for like okay. two seconds, but it's yeah, no worries because I, I, I was, was in here. Out on it, so I was How in here you? early anyway. And where are you? Where are you? I'm in Edmonton, Canada. So nice. like West Coast ish. Yeah. Still a boat, still a boat eight hour drive from the coast, but yeah. Still still a boat. Still a boat that yeah. <laughs> I said it, didn't I? I so you're the did. Vancouver side. Yeah, west yeah. side of Canada. So yeah. and where are you right now? I'm actually just outside of New Orleans. Caleb's going to be joining us in a few minutes, I'm assuming, but we're we're both in New Orleans. We've been here for ever, you know. Oh, excellent. Okay, cool. Yeah. Have you been uh, down here? I've never been down there. No, it's like on the list of places to visit for me. I'm actually leaving for San Francisco on Sunday for the first time. For fun or work? Fun. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I was there a few weeks ago and I that was my first time there since actually we were touring and oh my god I just love that city it's incredible I can't wait Amazing place are you going with family friends are you gonna is friends. You full, full downtime friends we're actually going down for a concert so it's gonna be good it's uh <laughs> good to go see. uh new kids and Vogue salt and Peppa, and Rick Astley they just played New Orleans last week that's awesome yeah, yeah. it's I talk about your amazing. 90s nostalgia show hey Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> someone told me they're like, um, there's like, are you going to the, to the show? And I didn't know they were playing and they were like, uh, they were from out of town and they were like, Oh, they're, we're going to a show at, at some club. And I'm like, is it Tipitina's or is the house of blues? And they're like, no, it's, it's like new kids in salt and pepper. I was like, yeah, you're not going to a club. You're going to an arena. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. Of course it was so out. So. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's glad. I'm happy to see these guys all still fill an arena. Gives me, gives me some joy. <laughs> and I love these package tours that are happening right now. Like Rick Springfield's coming down with Def Leppard. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'm in, you know. Really? All, and Journey, I think they're all putting these great package tours together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, to get people out of the house, everyone wants to go. But, you know, if you're going to spend a hundred bucks on the concert tickets, you need three hours of really killer shit. So, you know, I think that's the packages that are coming out. And it's awesome. It makes sense to do it this way. I mean, We've unless got, you're fighters, you know, then you can sell out any arena in the world. But we have uh, we have in our stadium here in Edmonton this summer. We have Def Leppard, Poison, Motley Crue, and Joan Jett as a package. So I, I be, think you're doing that same package down here. Yeah, I'll see Def Leppard anytime I can. Oh, we, yeah, absolutely. I saw them maybe probably four. I, I, that two years of COVID kind of changes all time, but yeah. probably four years ago. And oh my God, they sounded like it was 1985, 87 again. They sounded fantastic, you know? I don't even, if I recall the last time I saw them, it was probably about four or five years ago. I don't even think that they dropped the keys in the songs for Joe at all, even though it, they it, all I, sing. It, it didn't sound like it. Yeah. And, I, you and know, it's funny because I'm always on the lookout for that. And just, it's not, not as a deferential point, but it's just like, okay, you're 60 now, you know, yeah. <laughs> you like you were 19, but. Exactly. And the thing is, I'm, I don't judge about it either. Like it's, it's, it's oh, just life, <laughs> you know, yeah. like I'm not going to sit around and. Songs in, it's a great song. And just between me and you, poor John yeah. Bon Jovi, you know, like I they just that. did a tour and all he's getting is flack for his voice saw a headline on that what are you what are you i only saw one brief thing what are you hearing just he's not hitting it he's not hitting it and it's going he's tuning down more than like a half step that's for sure yeah but uh i feel bad for him i kind of think that maybe he should hang it up but it's kind of a hard thing to think of john bon jovi retiring it just is i don't know especially when you look as good as he does at like <laughs> what he's probably 60 63 he just 60. turned 60 yeah 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 i hope i look like that at 60 my god <laughs> Yeah. insane the only thing that changes he stopped dying his hair i know yeah <laughs> we're all gonna do that right <laughs> in fact i'm running straight over to walgreens to get some hair dye after we leave here so <laughs> 
I don't so want to be dying my hair as long as I can. Like, with, with radio music, everything. You look very young to know who the hell we are, first of all. I'm well, I'm 43. So oh, okay. well, there you, go. you look 30. So, so thank you. You got the Bon Jovi <laughs> thing going. Uh, <laughs> I swear there's no filters on here. Not too many anyway. <laughs> um, right. Well, my background is just like having grown up and like being educated in all the music I loved throughout the 90s. I ended up becoming an uh a rock singer for a, lo- a long period of time. I ended up learning music production, taking school for it. And then I just had the idea that why don't we do a podcast like this where we find out what people went through during that time yeah. and what they're doing now. Cause there's gotta be an equal focus on that. I, I love, I mean, I, my wife, I've been married for forever and she's amazing. And she always jokes She's like, you know, this whole behind the music, the VH1 thing that used to be like, I used to watch every single one of those. She's like, I'm sorry to tell you, but y'all are never going to be on behind the music because y'all were like the straightest, coolest band out there. You never got arrested. You never threw anything through hotel windows. She's like, I can write a tell all pamphlet front and back on, <laughs> on all the, the mischief you got into. I was like, well, you know, that's something you said for that. So. Wow. Wow. Like then I love I- the backstories though. I really do. That's awesome. It doesn't have to be like full of mischief and yeah. scandal. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's still good stories. You said Caleb's joining us, right? I believe he is. I don't have my phone with me, but I haven't heard that he's not. And we're, oh, you're at 703. I think he's supposed That's to be cool. so. We'll be wrapping by 730. Okay. Just to give this time to bounce down into my recording. And then I Perfect. hope that's okay with you guys. Of course. Yeah, whatever okay. works. Well, do you want to get started and Caleb can join us as he comes in? We could do that if you're cool with it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I also want to ask your permission if it's okay to use any of the video from this for promoting the episode on our YouTube channel. Yeah, permission granted. Okay. I always want to make Put sure. Put a on if I need it. <laughs> ah, you're great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This is Mark from Dead Eye Dick, who's joining me today. Caleb might be jumping in soon, but uh, welcome to Dope Nostalgia. And uh, where are you guys based out of? To uh, thanks for, first of all, Naomi, Naomi, thank you for having us. We're in New Orleans. We've always been here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been, that it was kind of our hometown, our adopted hometown for me. Uh, but we've been here for so long now. It's we, we're from here, so we toured every everything we did. We were based in New Orleans. We never left. Mm-hmm. That's such a great place to be from. Where do you recommend people to visit there? Well, like obviously, people want to go down to like the French Quarter and all of that. Yeah. But do you have any hidden gems that people should visit when they're down there? I do, and actually, um, there's a, my perfect time of year to be in New Orleans is Jazz Fest, which is always the last weekend of April, first weekend of May. And it just happened for the first time, obviously in a couple of years since COVID, but um, anytime you're in town for that, every restaurant is at their best, even though they're they're there anyway. But there's a little place uptown at the end of, of St. Charles called Giacomo's. And my that gets my vote for the greatest restaurant in the city. It's, it's unlike anything you'll ever see. The, the chef's name is Jacques, who at some point walks around with a bourbon bottle in his boxers and a shirt after cooking all night and will sit at your table and say, so where are you from? How's the food? <laughs> and, he, and he does this almost every night. So it's it's a pure New Orleans cultural exchange. You'll enjoy it. No kidding. That's and Jacques and Mose. Here, I'll meet you there and I'll buy you dinner. How about that? Hey, I'm in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Can't say no to that. Uh, sounds fun. I was going to say, um, now you guys probably get asked this all the time, so I'm going to keep it brief on this one. The band's inception, how did you all meet? So Caleb and I had a band basically before uh, Dead Eye Dick came into being. Um, we had actually had a couple together, and, and he and I just immediately, creatively, just absolutely just fell in love. And he, we were writing so much, and we ended up, getting out of a couple bands. And then uh, we were an acoustic duo for about a year. And then a mutual friend of ours uh, said, hey, you got to meet this guy, Billy. We were looking for a drummer actively, but we were very arrogant and we had very high standards. So I said, you got to meet this guy, Billy Landry. I think it'd be perfect for you. And the very first time we played with Billy, uh, it was just magic. So literally, I felt like he was auditioning us as much as anything else. And within 30 seconds, we were officially the band. And 
two weeks later, believe it or not, two weeks later, we recorded that entire first round. Oh, window Ooh. eye to eye with Billy, cueing him on the breaks because he had only heard some of the songs three or four times. We had played a couple shows, but and that's kind of an attest to Billy's professionalism and insane drumming technique. He's just he's just four on the floor. He's just absolutely one of the greatest drummers I've ever played with. So once that happened, we got a great record together and then everything kind of took off. No kidding. That is fast work. <laughs> of course, after four years of struggling to, to find the right fit. But once you find it, once that chemistry hits in the room, I think most of the bands who have made whatever level of success they have, and we had a minor level of success and a major level of success, depending on your, your vision of, of where you're sitting. But I think if you talk to anybody, they'll realize maybe the songs didn't that you didn't know there was going to be a giant hit, but you knew the people in the room were exactly who you needed to be with. Mm -hmm. And when you find that outside of my marriage to my wife, it's just like, that's kind of a really unique moment. It's a beautiful thing to find. So we're very lucky, all three of us. Absolutely. And not only that, but the three of you also have to have the same goals for it to work. Yeah. And uh, Naomi, I mean, honestly, number one was we had to treat it like a business. And that was all we had the creative side and we had the business side. And that was always rule number one. So we were trying to figure out, of course, this, you know, this is back in before we got signed. We got signed in 94. So it was get on the road, become a great band, try to build a following. We live in one of the greatest areas of, of America where within 500 miles, you know, you can play to 600 clubs. So we stayed on the road as much as we could. And that really made us a great live band. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, obviously it's very different, but once we realized that we were all in for the business and we we're in for the creative and those two meshed, um, then we made decisions based on that. And, and with a lot of luck and some great people who are our champions, you know, we had a run. It was great. When you're speaking of like that time too, when you're, and you're being a business and all, were you guys already like learning about the internet and were you getting involved in it and using it at all to promote yourself Not at that at point yet? Nope. No. In fact, uh, I'll say it didn't exist in our world because I know it existed, but mm -hmm. in fact, the, the very first time we went out on tour, we had a bag phone that was, you know, we call it the brick. It was literally as big as a laptop. <laughs> and when we bought the phone, the guy told us, don't ever make a phone call with this on your lap if you ever want to have children. So that's where <laughs> we were in the technological breakthrough of things. So rule number one is bag phone stays on the floor. So, but, you know, having a no nuclear bag. device or something. Right. There was no, for, for, for all, for all intents and purposes, there were no, there was no internet. Um, obviously MP3s hadn't even come out. So there wasn't a uh, Napster that had kind of changed the world. So mm -hmm. we were right on that cusp, which looking back now, honestly, is pretty fun to look at because it really was a whole different world, the way we had to make it and accept it and join it and love it and appreciate it and share it because it was, we saw every band on the way up. We saw the same bands that were on the, that we were on the way down or they were on the way up. And we, there was this community of bands that were all touring at the same time because we came up with, in 94, when we really started touring, we were already good friends with Hootie and the Blowfish guys. They were out of South Carolina. We would swap shows. Um, Rob Thomas had a band before called Matchbox 20 called Tabitha Secret. And Tabitha Secret did a whole Florida tour with us for about five or seven shows opening for us. And then he, he, he and one other person left, I believe, and became Matchbox 20. And then there's, you know, Edwin McCain was getting out there and, and all these bands, Collective Soul, we had our uh, a release party with them in New Orleans at Tipitina's. We both put out our first single on the same day. And then flash forward to probably seven years ago, we did a South by Southwest show and they paired us up with Collective Soul again. So we were like, oh my God, this is a full circle. But the community back then in 94, 95, when everything was really starting to, to jettison for us was, was really amazing. And you were out on the road in hotels, in vans and buses, and you saw everyone around. We played with the Smithereens probably mm -hmm. 20 times. And then Pat, ended up the lead singer that Smithereens ended up moving to New Orleans. We became friends 10 years later. So it's the, the circle of life, so to speak, of the 90s music is mm. really unique. 
and and just I'm so grateful we were in that moment of time and doing what we were doing. Well, it's delightful to know that you guys all like had a common bond and a lot of you toured together and knew each other. Um, yes. I, it makes me wonder too how now I know the grunge era had come in a bit before that. And I don't really know if it was going away yet at that time or not. Did you feel any after effects, you or the other bands, from the grunge era into what you guys were doing? We, uh, Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, we felt everything because I think Nirvana hit in 93, maybe? 92? I think 92 is when Nevermind yeah. came out. Okay, so yeah. And the moment that came out, grunge was out, right? But we were, I mean, you've heard the song and maybe some of the other albums we've done, but we were a British pop band. This is really what we were. We wanted to be the Beatles, not as mm -hmm. far as global success, but m one of our main musical inspirations was the Beatles among mm -hmm. 20 others. So yeah. when we had already made our record in 92, actually, the, the day probably that, that Nevermind came out, we had made this bright British pop record. And when once we got out in 94, we were in this flood of Pearl Jam, who I adore, Nirvana, who was fantastic, Stone Temple Pilots, one of the greatest bands on the planet. So we were, and Green Day. So we played festivals with a lot of grunge bands. And we fit, ironically, musically. I don't know why, but we would always share a dressing room backstage. We share a dressing room with the Lemonheads and Bush and um, Green Day and all these bands. And as different as we were, when I listened to like Billy Joe Armstrong, the melodies he writes, who was one of my favorite melodic songwriters on the planet. Mm. If you listen to his melodies, if you take away the incredibly great sounding guitars, you're left with really old school, amazing Beatles era melodies that just rock your head. And that's really what we were going for as well. So whether or not you turn the distortion on your guitar up or, or down really didn't matter to us or any of these bands because we were all out there trying to write great pop songs. And then, you know, whatever you want to label it from there is none of us cared. Grunge, right. pop, what, whatever it was. You know, we were talking about New Kids on the Block. You mm -hmm. know, if it's a good song, it's a good song. And if you're a great live band, you're a great live band. Mm -hmm. And that's what we just we just dove into. And that, that was our mantra every single day. Play the songs, enjoy them, love the people you're with, become a great band and deliver it. And if you can do all those things, then everything else is really kind of out of your control, you know? Amen. I mean, it all boils down to a melody and a lyric. And then whatever you do behind it is what classifies it in any type of genre anyways. So 100%. And know, you look at a guy like Michael, Michael Buble, who is one of my favorites. He takes, he, you know, he, he's not this Frank Sinatra where he's doing the, the very accurate remakes of old songs, but he'll take old songs and do them. Like he does a, a bunch of Beatles songs. He does um, uh, one of the Beatles songs he does, you know, anyway, he does it big band style and he mm -hmm. absolutely kills it. I'm like, and it's exactly what you just said. Song, melody, however you're translating it, however you're redefining it, if you're, true to yourself about what you want to do then man it's a great song a great song is a great song exactly yeah and they, and those are the ones that stand the test of time as well and yeah, it's they, nice to it's nice to know that now here we are this many years later and we're still hearing your song on the airwaves we still hear new age girl all the time i'm uh should i send an apology letter for that or is that a good thing? no <laughs> no and yeah. anytime i talk about it the first people that the first thing they say is oh but you sure like the bone yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. How many times in your life do people come up to you and say that? A lot. And we also get the, well, first of all, I, I don't want, I'm, I'm being false, falsely, you know, the, the self-deprecation. No one could be more proud of what we did and the songs we wrote. And even including that one, we love it. And just to see a crowd, you know, respond to it is, is like not every band dreams of that. So anyone who tells you I didn't want to be a big band, well, then you say, well, you shouldn't have signed a, re a record contract. So mm -hmm. we're extraordinarily proud of everything we did. Um, yes. So to the, to the, to the catchphrase, we got a lot of girls uh, around the world coming up with their driver's license and they were actually legally named Mary Moon. So that happened a lot. And what? yeah, wow. it or not. 
And then one of we, yeah, we did get the catchphrase thrown a lot. One of my favorites is we're at a record signing and I want to say it's Flint, Michigan. It's somewhere in January. It's 20 below. We had to put a, a cigarette lighter up to the padlock because the padlock steel had shrunk and we couldn't get a key into it. So this is, this is how cold it is. And we go into this record signing store and there's, it's packed and it's, you know, the great thing about going to Lima, Ohio in January is you kind of own the town because there's nothing else going on there. So it's kind of like going to Canada in the winter. <laughs> so we go into this place and it's packed and we're, we're so grateful for the people showing up and we're signing autographs. And this one woman comes up probably about our age at the time. And she has this little five, six year old girl and she says, you know, I love your song and my daughter loves your song. And the daughter says, what does it mean? She don't eat meat, but she sure like the bone. <laughs> and I'm thinking five-year-old. And we said, well, she's a vegetarian, but she still really loves ribs. <laughs> and my, mom looks at me and gives me a big wink. And the girl goes, oh, of course, that's so awesome. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> dodge the bullet with a five-year-old. <laughs> I don't even think I knew what it was talking about then. So, wow. Yeah. And the funny thing is, as I look back on that, on the lyrics, you know, obviously that's the lyric that stands out and it is sexual and we own it and it is what it is. But at the end of the day, if you really look at the lyrics of the song in 94, it was a song that was about massive female empowerment. Mm -hmm. And it was about a woman who lives her life the way she wants to live it. She is loving the, the planet and doesn't care if you make fun of her. So, and actually I was having a conversation about it maybe a few years ago and they were like, you know, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a interesting song. I was like, it's really, when you get down to it, it's kind of cool that we unknowingly were, I mean, you know, I was brought up by women and my mom and her sisters were phenomenal. So I'm, I'm the product of a female household. Mm. And, um, but to, to look at that, you know, 30 years later and say, you know, if you, if you really look into it, it's kind of a cool female empowerment. And I have a, I have a yeah. 13 year old daughter now. So I can say if, you know, she's heard the song, she loves the song, but if you forget the catchphrase and you look at it, it's actually, you know, there's nothing, it's about owning your sexuality, not with my 13 year old, but with, with mm -hmm. adult women, it's being who you are, owning your sexuality, own your, owning your support staff, owning your confidence and getting out there and if we put a little joke at the end of the course, then, you know, <laughs> that's what we did. So, oh, well. It worked out perfectly. It did. And it's a great line. And the whole thing is true. And, it, and I think it really resonates with people strongly, especially to this day. Did you oh. go into writing it for the album or how did the whole Dumb and Dumber soundtrack part of it come along into play? Yeah. So th the two parts of that are the writing and then Dumb and Dumber. So the, the writing part of it was when Caleb and I first got together, uh, he gave me a cassette of four or five songs he had written that he wanted his, my opinion. Hey, this is me as a songwriter, if you like it. So I learned all those four songs. And I, I fell in love with them and they're fantastic. And then I flipped over the tape and it just said uh, NG on the back. And, and he was like, don't worry about any of that stuff. So I played that on the, the back of the tape and it was like a really crude recording of guitar riffs and some lyrics and the melody over it it wasn't really fully formed but immediately like pro hopefully the first time you heard it I was like wait a minute this is so just the riff alone is awesome so I told Caleb I was like this is a great beginning of a song man you know this needs to be finished so it was the way Dumb and Dumber happened was the song was already peaking on the charts in America and we had been to Europe already twice, I think. And then this is, goes back to that dumb luck of you, you got to have your ducks in a row and be prepared when opportunity comes is the, the, Far the Farley, Farley brothers from Dumb and Dumber who wrote and directed it called our agent and said, we love the song. We have a Jim Carrey movie that is totally tongue in cheek the whole time. We'd love to use a song. Is this okay? And we were like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. And we were like, you know, high-fiving everyone who would within a block of us because Jim mm -hmm. Carrey at that point had just done The Mask. And I don't think he had really broken out. So, but we were all fans of his. Oh, he had done Ace Ventura. Yeah. Which is amazing, you know? And so mm -hmm. 
it fit perfectly. It fit the movie perfectly. It fit the timing perfectly. So when the song had already peaked, it actually came down and we got a whole second life all the way back up the charts with it, which was great for us. And, you know, I've got the, got the Dumb and Dumber records up here. To play yeah, this I saw. That's so cool. Gave us another little, uh, little run on it. So. Fantastic. And did you get a chance to meet the cast or anything crazy like that? We were going to, and oh. if fate had been different, we would have. We were invited to the Dumb and Dumber premiere of the movie in New York. Uh, and Jim Carrey was obviously be there. The Farrelly brothers would be there. And we already had, a, it was around Christmas. It was right before Christmas. We had a Christmas show booked. You're going to love this. It was Dead Eye Dick, uh, The Go-Go's, <gasps> and Boys to Men. So Wow, two diverse. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. First, the Go-Go's, oh my God. I mean, I was in love. Yeah. But whoever put together those three bands was either genius or just really high. I'm not sure which, but that's a great, it turned out to be a really fantastic show that we played. For sure. Just and it like was like the, in West Virginia, like in the middle of West Virginia before Christmas. It was crazy. So we didn't get to go to the, to the uh, thing, but we had an incredible experience watching the Go-Go's and Boys to Men, so. No kidding. And they're both incredible artists too, just as much as, wow. <laughs> and you know, what's funny is, is whenever I look back and we, whenever we get together with the guys and, and we'll have them, like I, I live out in the country, so we'll have campfires and everyone brings guitars and all our friends bring guitars and we'll play for four hours and, and drink and eat and have crawfish boiled. But whenever we start talking about these days, which inevitably we do, and we start, when we laugh till our stomachs hurt, but what pops in mind is not what we did, but who, with whom we got to do it. Like we'll name yeah. all the bands we got to play with because these are all, you know, if, 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 it, if in our heyday, we got to open for the police or you two, which are my two bands of all time, mm. that would be worth everything in the world for what you did. So we go through this list of these bands we either played, opened for, opened for us, did festivals with, and that's kind of full circle back to our community of knowing that that was the moment of time where we existed. And it's so different now that I wouldn't trade those days, that time frame for anything, because the people we got to play against, with, after, before, which just, I have some old festival posters that we played and I'm looking at them it's like, oh my God, you know, how did yeah. we make this list? But we did, and I'm grateful for it. And I'm very proud of it, you know. I'm glad you kept those types of things. It's nice to have that memorabilia. I have boxes and crates. And then my mom has boxes and crates. And then my wife has boxes. So, yeah, nice. storage unit at some point. So besides that one concert with the amazing lineup, what is one of your other most memorable performances that stand out? Um, we Yeah, we, we had some, some insane ones. Um, I mean, all the festivals, all the giant festivals stand out a lot because, you know, you're walking out on stage into 45 to 70,000 people. Mm -hmm. The first time we ever played Jazz Fest, which we mentioned earlier, we walked out of the big stage in our hometown and there were 65,000 people and the governor and his wife and everyone, all the politicians and all the, the celebrities, you know, are down front. Mm -hmm. And to feel your hometown just really literally blow your hair back and you feel your shirt move. There's nothing like that because it's your hometown. Yeah. Um, the other great experience we had, which is more funny than anything, is we shared, uh, we, we played the first festival in New Orleans called Zephyr Fest, and we got awarded our first gold records on stage at that festival in New Orleans. And we were sharing a trailer with the Lemonheads and Bush. Mm -hmm. And, at the, you know, I stayed out of the trailer because as soon as you opened the door, it was just a fog machine in there because it was so much dope that was just wading out of, of the door. I was like, I'm, until we're done with the show, I'm going to stay out of the, of the dressing room, you know? So, but it was kind of one of those funny things, you know, going to the restroom and then Gavin and then uh, who's the guy from Woman Heads walks up and then you're Gavin sitting. Dando, Gavin right? Dando, yeah. you know. And they're friends. And then Mila is, at that point, I think Evan was dating Mila. And so you're at three urinals and you look down and you're like, you look up, fortunately, you look up and next to you and you're like, what the hell's going on? 
<laughs> how did I get dropped into this world? And you know, what a, what a great uh, celebrity urinal, urinal event this is going on here. So. Yeah, no, what a meeting! I swear, yeah, it must be moments where you were just like, I can't believe it. this is my life right now. Yeah, <laughs> and those are the moments you remember. I mean, you remember the crowds, and you actually believe it or not, you remember faces in the crowds too. But you know, you you remember like. The, the five-year-old in the record store. And I remember the letters we would get on stage afterwards from like a nine-year-old or from like a 16-year-old who would say, you know, you're my favorite band or whatever. And I remember when I was that age in my teens, for me, and I'm going through this with my daughter who's 13 right now, music was absolutely everything to me. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was in, if I was in my room, there was music on. If I was out in the living room, there's music on. So I knew all my favorite bands and they shaped me and they warped me and they turned me into exactly who is. And, and the reason I got into music was the police and U2. The reason I started listening to music was Motown and big band and mm. James Taylor and Elton John and Billy Joel in the seventies when I was super young. And then if, you know, imagine playing a show and afterwards someone came and was like, y'all are really one of my favorite bands. Y'all are so much fun. And, and I'll have listened to music for the last whatever years. And, you, you, if you can't take a step back and say, I'm just grateful, if you can't mm. grab that moment, then I think you've missed the whole bus on the whole thing. Because yeah. that's really that when that comes full circle and, and, you know, you're not everyone's favorite band. And there are half the people in this world who cannot stand the song New Age Girl. That's fine with me because the people who do love it. And mm. I'm proud of what we did. And I remember bands that I just lived for growing up. And if you can have one moment from someone saying, hey, y'all were really good, even just that was fun. You don't need to be their favorite band, but for them to remember you and take the time to come up and say, hey, y'all were awesome. Just wanted to shake your hand. Just want to give you a high five. You know, it's the little things in life back then and now that really matter. And that's the things you remember. Gratitude. That is absolutely every day, every yes. day. When you lose that, it's all over, right? Amen. I was going to say now going into where we're at now, we're kind of coming out of this pandemic era. Now, what current projects have you guys started to do now? And what are the goals that lie ahead? It's more, uh, actually, it's funny because a month ago, two months ago, we had a reunion, which we do about every eight years. And we do always do in New Orleans. And all, all of our old friends, we either do it at House of Blues or Tipitina's or some big clubs. We did one on the North Shore, which is kind of outside of New Orleans for the first time. But that, you know, we hadn't played together in eight years. So we had two or three rehearsals. And that's about all it took. Actually, after, I think after the first or second rehearsal, we were like, all right, we can do this. And we played and we played for two, two and a half hours. We played so long and so much. And it was absolutely perfect. It was absolutely, it was just everything because we're now older. And the best part about it is we didn't have to break down our gear and put it in a van and drive to another show. Yeah. It was, now we can all go out to a really cool dinner. Let's go get a midnight breakfast somewhere. Wasn't this amazing? It feels so good to be back on stage with y'all. Yeah. And there was no expectations, you know? We had a lot of people show up, a lot of people we haven't seen in forever. So as far as the band goes, really, we just do reunions every now and then. Uh, we're all, Caleb and I are very much still into music. Um, I'm actually in my home studio right now. I, I'll do more soundtrack stuff. I actually spent a lot of time in Nashville. I put out a country record uh, probably eight or 10 years ago now. Uh, wow. under my name. So I wrote, I, I went, I became a songwriter in Nashville for about four years and fell in love with songwriting all over again. And it was just fantastic. Um, I still do that a lot. I still write a lot, either with artists or on my own. I'll record a lot at the home studio, but now I'm listening to bands that are like, like 21 Pilots when they came out, like my head exploded. And so I started learning some of their chord changes. I'm like, this is Beaters, this is the Beatles rubber soul and revolver era chord changes. And that just proves to me that a good song, a good melody, a structure stands up over decades because those guys are fantastic. Muse is one of my favorite bands on the planet. So mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, I've been finding new favorite bands that just blow my socks off. And so immediately, and it's funny, I'll, I'll take my daughter to school in the morning and she'll put on 
whatever the the serious radio TikTok radio and then you know hits and whatever and it's songs i've never heard but after about a week or two i'm taking pictures of the song that's on the radio because i want to come home i want to pull it up in the studio and listen to their production and listen to core changes and listen to what they're doing and it's really inspiring to sit back down and hit record and just see what comes out so I have no plans. I mean, you know, I put out stuff every now and then. I, I was actually going to put out a couple singles this summer because they're kind of fun, fun summer songs. But there's no big golden plan to have another career run. And when you take away, kind of like a reunion, when you take away that pressure, mm-hmm. and it's so much fun. It's so much fun to just record and write yeah. songs with Caleb and have Caleb come over and do this, you know, this this vocal or do this guitar part and getting to a point where you don't expect anything and you're not relying on it to provide or to buy a house for you, you know, Mm -hmm. that's a pretty great, great place to be. My daughter's texting me. Sorry. Oh, that's (laughs) cool. No worries. No. And I'm so glad to know that you guys are in that place right now. It's a good space to be in. And it's just been so fantastic learning all about your history and what's going on. And we'll make sure to keep following you and update our listeners with any new news of stuff you're putting out. It would be awesome. Please do. And I, I think I have a contact for, for you. So anytime you're in New Orleans, seriously, call me up and I'll meet you at, at uh, Giacomo's. It'll be a great day. Oh, that'd be so amazing. It's on the list. It might take me a while to get there, but I'll get there. Anytime. <laughs> Mark, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for your time on Dope Nostalgia today. My pleasure too. I, I, I love the website. I love the podcast. It's going to be awesome. Thank you for including thank, us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, I know I have to run, but uh, once again, yeah, I'll keep in touch. Let's cross paths. Love it. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.